All right, let's begin with commodities. A commodity is something which is useful to human beings and which is bought and sold between them. Thus, commodities can be evaluated in two very different ways. One, in terms of their inherent useful qualities, i.e. their use value, and two, in terms of their relation to other commodities, i.e. their exchange value, the reduction of two or more commodities to some third measurable factor, e.g. money. In other words, a commodity is a quality reduced to a quantity for the purpose of exchange within society. It represents an intersection between physis and nomos, reality and convention, nature and society. In classical economics, a given commodity's exchange value is a function of its scarcity versus its desirability, i.e. of its supply and demand within a given economy. E.g., people will pay more for bottled water in a desert than beside a sweet water spring. Thus, the price of a commodity represents how much the average buyer will sacrifice to obtain it. But Marx argues the reverse. The price of a commodity represents how much the producer sacrificed in order to make it. This alternative model is called the labor theory of value. The sacrifice of the producer is called labor and labor is quantified as the average labor time necessary within a given society to produce a given commodity. Thus, exchange value is a function not of scarcity and desirability, but of labor time and efficiency of production. To exchange a commodity is to polymorph it. There are two kinds of polymorphing. One, a use value into an exchange value, i.e. commodity into money or selling, and two, an exchange value into a use value, i.e. money into a commodity or buying. The circulation of commodities is a series of such exchanges. Normally, commodity circulation is undertaken to polymorph one use value into another use value, i.e to turn lead into gold. The simplest series for this is commodity, money, commodity, or selling in order to buy. This series is always finite because the goal is the consumption of a commodity's use value, which effectively ends its circulation in the market. But there is a reverse type of commodity circulation, which polymorphs one exchange value into another exchange value, i.e duplicating a gold coin. The simplest series for this is money, commodity, money, or buying in order to sell. This series is potentially infinite because it does not end in consumption. It is merely the multiplication of potential, not the trading of actualities. The extra value conjured in this process is called surplus value, and it is the foundation of capitalism. Surplus value is not generated in either the buying or the selling because exchange is always equal. It comes, instead, through the exploitation of the laborer, the worker or proletariat. In a capitalist society, laborers treat their labor, i.e. their time spent laboring, as a commodity for sale. But labor time is unique among commodities because labor time is itself the means of producing exchange value. Thus, the laborer, by means of his labor time, increases the exchange value of the materials he labors upon, without the exchange value of his own labor time increasing with them. Thus, surplus value is normally generated by buying enough labor time from the laborer that the total exchange value of the commodities he produces exceeds the exchange value of the labor by which he produced them e.g., a capitalist pays a worker $500 for 10 hours of labor, during which time the worker produces commodities worth $750. 
Thus, the dwarf Alberic from Wagner's The Ring commissions his underlings to forge the Rhine gold into a magic ring by which he might then dominate them. The laborer is treated as a means merely, and is cast off with his wages as soon as the commodity is finished. The capitalist's game is buying in order to sell at a profit, specifically buying labor time to produce commodities worth more than the labor time spent producing them, i.e. surplus value. The capitalist begins with a certain amount of exchange value, which he invests as capital in materials, machinery, and labor time. The resulting surplus value is then reinvested and the cycle continues, so that capital, mobilized surplus value, multiplies itself exponentially. This is called the accumulation of capital, and like an erosive river, it recruits more and more of its host society into its circulation. This is simply because an increase of capital requires an increase of paid labor time to valorize it, i.e. mine its surplus value. This results in a tidal rhythm of growth and recession. A glut of labor is hired to deal with a glut of capital, and as soon as the glut is diminished, the labor force is diminished along with it. The remaining labor force is then squeezed for another glut of capital, and the cycle repeats. Thus, the accumulation of capital is necessarily accompanied by an accumulation of workers, who are dragged back and forth in the tide between employment and unemployment, boom and bust. Marx calls this growing population of periodically dispossessed workers an industrial reserve army, and the growth of this immiserated army is called the general law of capitalist accumulation. Capital is immiserated workers, and the more capital, the more immiserated workers. From the perspective of world history, capitalism is merely a transitional phase. Before capitalism, although the workers were legally bound to a ruler, they still retained their own means of production, land, farming equipment, etc. Under capitalism, workers are legally free, but can only produce via the capitalist in a factory or plantation. The original capitalists violently expropriated individual means of production and mobilized them as collective means of production in their own service. This is what Marx refers to as private property. Collective means of production, but they are privately owned by the capitalist and not by the workers. Eventually, the growing army of atomized liquidated workers, now trained in collective production on the factory floor, will expropriate the capitalists' private means of production and mobilize them as their own collective means of production. Thus, the capitalist unwittingly affects the unification and communization of the human race, and is shrugged off like a butterfly's chrysalis.